uh, I'm fascinated with identity crises because when I was young, I had one myself, which is I went from being a young, unknown, rather nice young Brooklyn boy uh, to being a celebrity overnight and was totally unequipped for it and had an identity crisis. Uh, as I said in over time, people are almost tired of hearing me say it. Um, it was as if there was somebody named Norman Mailer, and to meet him, people had to meet mm-hmm. me first. Well, the Egg of the Dead, which was one of the two <clears throat> novels to come out of World War II, uh, <clears throat> that sort of defined the war. The other one was uh, James Jones's uh, From Here to Eternity. <laughs> James Jones and Norman Mailer, two young writers, literally overnight became famous. And uh, that's what he's talking about. When Norman's fir- first check, I think if I'm correct, it was he got a check for 10000 from his publisher. And he couldn't believe it. And Norman said, he, all he did is he went around town. And he, and if he'd see someone, he'd give him money. He, he gave the 10000 He cast the check, got the money, and just gave it away. He was overjoyed. <laughs> couldn't believe it. Uh, but that's what made him, was that uh, was that book, The Naked and the Dead. I don't know if anyone reads it anymore, but it, uh, it's funny because he was never in the war, Norman. I mean, he was in the army, but he never he never made it to actually in the battle. But it's a wonderful account of boys in battle, it's, but stories he heard from his friends who were in the, in the army. I met him, and it was during the war in Vietnam. It must have been around 1968, and I had published a book my first book, but I was at, uh, I published my first book, which was called I Ain't Marching Anymore, and uh, 23, like and Norman, uh, and I had a book party at um, Columbia, at the, we took over the chapel. <coughs> one, of, one of the many things I did at Columbia, which they never forgave me, <coughs> and Norman was one of the people who came to the, to the party, that's the first time I met him, and then he invited me down to the village where he was giving a uh, speech at the Fillmore East and it was um, he for some reason he got he <clears throat> he he um, so this book a year later so I, I go down to the seat and yes here's how he starts the speech I'll never forget this. I'm sitting in the Fillmore East and it's, you know I got a couple of friends with me you know, and he stands up and he's got his hands shoved in his pockets like that. <laughs> You know, he's, it's like a matador facing the bull. He says, uh, he says, guy sees his ex-wife at a bar sitting with her new boyfriend. He goes up to her and he says, how you doing, honey? And he turns to the, you're the and he says, so you're the new guy? And the guy says, yeah. And he says to him, what's it like to carry? And the guy says, it's pretty good once I get past the worn out part. <laughs> so, <that's, laughs> and of course, he was booed off the stage. So we ended up going to uh, Max's Kansas City, which is around the corner. That's when I really got to know him. I thought, to, I, I mean, there's something, I didn't like the joke, but I thought, God, this guy's got balls. And then, of course, you, you, a long time you, later, you realize that Norman was very much, he was a, <clears throat> a fame whore. And he did a, a lot of things, some of which I did to prove of in order to get attention. So I'm sure before he died. He got very, uh, it's funny, because they came, Arthur Schlesinger, got, when he just before he died, when I saw, when I saw him, I, he was a, a historian. He, he, but I was shocked at how tiny he had become. I mean, physically tiny, like a doll. <clears throat> and Norman, before he died, suddenly he started getting very, very small. I don't, I can't understand why, why what happens. He suddenly started getting very small. And uh, last time I saw him was in uh, Brooklyn um, with Doris. He was, uh, you know, very, he, he, very clear he was at the end. No, it, it wasn't in Brooklyn, it was at the hospital, because I went to the hospital to see him um, with Norris. Yeah, I don't think she should have, but she did. Long time, it was the longest. Of his wife, she was the longest. Last thing, I don't know, 20 years maybe. I really don't remember. She was better than he was. And actually, I think she wrote a better book. I just never understood. I don't think Norman liked women because he treated them so like I told you this, but I'd have dinners for, you know, I'd have a party and I'd invite Norman, <clears throat> I'd invite Truman. When they got married, I'd, like I told you, I'd have a big party for them, dinner party for them, and invited Truman. Anyway. I said, enough of this shit to Truman. I said, enough of this fucking shit. And I started naming all these people coming. If Jan can, blah, 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 coming, why the fuck? Can you come, for God's sake, come do it for me. And he said, I'm not going to do his voice. Oh, no, I can't come, I can't come, I can't risk it. And I said, what are you talking about? Oh, he's always, he's always wanted to have sex with me. He's going to rape me. I can't come. 
include what he said. No, no, no. He's always wanted to rape me. No. And did he? <laughs> no. It's funny because Tennessee was would avoid Norman too, and he go because he was afraid of Norman. You know, so Norman would beat him up. <laughs> what? What? I have no idea. <clears throat> when he met Norman, was at a party years ago, and Tennessee was famous then. And I think Tennessee was famous before Norman. And he was with uh, for Frankie Verlo, his, his Tennessee's boyfriend, lover. And Tennessee only vaguely knew who Norman was. And Norman came up to Tennessee and then said to Tennessee, You're a fucking asshole. You come out outside, I'm going to fucking beat the shit out of you. And, you know, Norman's standing like this. And Frank Merlo, cool with Tennessee's lover, standing next to him and simply pushed him like that and said to him, I know the fuck you are, but I fight for Mr. William. You want to fight, let's go. I fight for Mr. William. Was this a common conversation that happened? At- True story. Anyway. Why, why did Norman come up to Tennessee and th- want to have a fight with him? Uh, good copy. Good copy. Because Nor- Tennessee was very famous son. So he just came up to him and. <laughs> I think he was. I think in part he was jealous because he felt competitive. So he just like out of the blue just. Ca- yeah, came that's, yeah, yeah. I guess that's some sort of. Um, I well, guess that's I some sort of straight bullying of at the at, at the highest level. Well, he was a bully, Norman, and also. Uh, I mean, I never felt it, but I think deep down he had there was a certain level of homophobia. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure. <clears throat> Which is, I think, part. Sure, of his, everybody had a little bit. <clears throat> part of his generation, I think. Yeah. You know, yeah. he was very tolerant, very, you know, in the, in a formal sense, yeah. but emotionally, but deep down, he had his limit. Yeah, don't we all? Um, so we're going to go to the diner, right? Yes. Um, let's play a little bit more of this, and then we'll go get dinner. So, um, let me just, I want to check this one. Yeah. We want to do all this, and then I have no record of it. But. Let me ask you, we, in terms of the World Trade Center, just a parenthetical. In 1983, 1993, the building was already attacked. And you called it the symbol of American capitalism. If the symbol of American capitalism could be once attacked, how is it possible that it could have been attacked again? How is it possible that... Well, let's get to that, but, okay. but in fact, uh, the first attack, while it did damage, did not seize the American imagination. Now, the American imagination is almost when you start talking about America, one of the problems always been talking about America is the country, there are times when the country can almost be seen as a creature. In other words, it, it, it reacts with a unanimity that's staggering that you don't find in other countries. And especially when you have a country as large, as diffuse, as contradictory, with as many uh, odd and disassociated elements as the United States. It's absolutely incredible. I mean, I, I, I'll, just, I'll just say I think I, he's wrong about that. I think lots of countries, I think all countries act as creatures. I mean, that's why they're countries. Russia is acting like a creature in its invasion of Ukraine. That goes back to what I said earlier. Ukraine is acting like a creature in its defense. It wasn't as united until Russia invaded. It became... That's what it, it reinforced its identity. Yeah. yeah. But that goes back to what I was quoting Henry Kissinger as saying. National interests never change. Well, I don't know what that means, I guess. I mean, it, it seems like national interests do change, you know, until the Russia invaded. It wasn't, you know, Ukraine had maybe similar national interests, but different national interests nonetheless. So Ukraine's, I don't want to argue about yeah. it, but Ukraine's national interest, like most countries, is to stay independent. It's to be Ukraine, not to be absorbed into some other nationality and lose its own identity. And if you look at just wars in general, much of the psychological and emotional energy that fuels war <clears throat> is the threat to the identity of the country. But identities change. Hmm? But identities change. National identities? Yeah. I mean, yeah, absolutely. I mean, the borders change. The no composition borders. of no, borders. populations change. Borders. I mean, national, what is national identity? National identity is the confluence, you know, the aggregate of the people there, how I, how they self-identify, how they think of each other. Uh, well, they, it's, it's, yeah. it's, you know, it's all those things, right? But everyone has an identity. Which changes constantly. Yeah, but if you, if you take an American and move them to the south of France for 30 years and wake them up in the middle of the night and say, what are you? They'll say, I'm an American. I think I did. Well, I don't know if they will. I mean, that's, I'm pretty sure. Well, I know... I came, look, I came, I came here, right? I was born in the Soviet Union. I came and here. to me, you're still a little rusky. Well, I'm, you know, to me, <laughs> I'm, I'm both and I'm neither. Um, but I'm, def- you know, I'm not Russian. I'm not, I don't have the same 
opinions, my outlook on the world is much closer probably to an American, in a New Yorker, let's say, than it is to a Moscovite, almost certainly. I mean, I'm much more of a New Yorker. I have a lot of things about me. I, I, I'm still shaped a lot by that. I still have a lot of nostalgia well, I think for it. you're going it. back to New Yorker. Yeah, because I've lived here. And that's what's happened. You know, I wasn't born here. No, no, I know, but if people... I, if, if you go to London or you go to Paris or anywhere in the world and, and people say, where are you from? And you say, I'm, well, I'm a New Yorker. No one's going to challenge you and say, oh, no, you're not a New Yorker because you seem like a New Yorker. Exactly. But, so yeah, I, but if you changed. say, oh, I'm a Londoner. Or, or, oh, what are you doing in London, people would say. But if I lived there for 20 years, maybe I would speak like a... Maybe you would. Maybe you wouldn't. Yeah. Anyway. There's no time that we act, as we say, like a creature has a response, a response of death. That did not happen with the earlier attack. That day, people were shot, but finally they caught the people who did it almost immediately, if I recall. Yes. And, uh, and a, lot of, a lot of damage done, and some people were killed. It was not a catastrophe. This dwarf nature, when the buildings went down, when the entire nation by then saw those buildings crumble, when they saw bodies flying through the air, because they couldn't stand the flames, and so they preferred a death by, by what could one say, by, by a descent into the implacable surface of the earth, rather than to be roasted alive where they stood. Well, right. those sort of things are all the elements of a dream, of a nightmare. So there was no comparison between the two. The, the, the second catastrophe was not even one, two orders of magnitude greater than the first one. And on top of that, the uh, terrorists had gotten away with how they immolated themselves. They had died in the crash. And so that was staggering, because the country, America now got to the point where it's gotten so large, so comfortable, so wealthy, that I think, oh, shoot, that, uh, I think, and I agree with you, that first attack affected New York, and there was a lot of outrage, particularly down in the Wall Street section. <laughs> As you got farther out to the, by the time you got to Coney Island, it wasn't that big anymore. Yeah. And once you crossed the water over to the mainland, uh, people didn't give a damn. That was that New York's an ugly, rotten city. And secretly, they felt maybe New York deserves it. Which is one of the things I've talked about before, which is there's so many separate elements and enclaves and, and uh, regions and territories and no-nos in the country that it's always rare when the country reacts, as I say, like a creature. So the first time, you didn't have that at all. What, what you have was exactly that. You know, by the, once you got out of New York, the general feeling as well, New York probably deserves it. Although no one would express it. Go back. I thought the point, go, go back to the point where yeah, well, the rest of the country thought New York deserved it. I don't think that's true at all. And I think that comes out of the fact that I don't think Norman knew America. He knew New York. He certainly knew Brooklyn. But I don't think in terms of, of the rest of America, I don't think Norman had a clue. I mean, his only sort of real intercourse with other Americans was during the war with his <clears throat> soldier buddies. But in terms of the country itself, no, and the only sort of person who brought a widening vision of what America really is was, was Norris from Arkansas. And, um, she, and I think Norris saw Norman as a kind of a provincial, and in a real way he was. Uh, but she put up with a lot, Norris.